here I am. It's pretty weird to be in the grass, huh? It's now. I can't change it now. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Oh my gosh, Alvin's always there to say good morning. Thank you, Alvin. It's, you know, it actually means a lot to me. Um, I said good night too yesterday, remember? You did, you did, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I mean, this morning. <laughs> right, right, it was early this morning, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, yeah, it means a lot, so thank you. Um, let's see now. Um, all right, so uh, <clears throat> I went through things I started, kind of got myself together yesterday finally and went through all this. And I realized this old homework is really long. And I'm sorry, I actually cut it back really significantly. And then, then I went over it again, it was still really long. So I moved the due date back to a week from tomorrow. So uh, I'll have time to go through all of the content uh, well in advance of the due date. Um, Sorry about that. I just I didn't see it quite coming that way. Um, so uh, we can more or less take our time here, but um, uh, I know what I got. I'm going to get my stupid document camera going. Um, the computer turned off last night and turned back on, and it's been really annoying getting it all going again. So there's my document camera. Okay. All right, so that's kind of happening. And um, all right, so I'll just dive in. Um, uh, first of all, um, when you talk about precision, um, we, uh, we have to consider various uh, sources of variation, right? So there's, you could say the same with accuracy with all these things, you know? Um, but precision is a little bit easier to get your mind around, I think. Um, <clears throat> so uh, instrument precision is just, um, if you run the same measurement again, right? That's normally what we think of precision, right? This is the normal precision. Intra-assay um, is just done at different times and, and uh, different, different um, kind of different samples of the same material. It's not a super, super rigorously defined thing, but um, so this is the same sample, this is different samples, you know, maybe different times of the day. Then <clears throat> intermediate precision or ruggedness is different people, you know, and uh, different people and different instruments on different days, right? So um, maybe the same lab, you know. So if an assay is real rugged, then it, it won't care who's doing it, what instrument will say. You know? And then interlaboratory is um, it's the same sample, but analyzed by different people in different laboratories. Right? So these are just different ways that you can define the precision of a method, since we're working sort of on methods right now. All right. Um, I don't know if we're going to have any testing on this, kind of doubt it, but just so you know. Um, uh, next, uh, the horn of its trumpet. It's a weird thing, but it's true. Um, 
So as the, um, uh, so what this means really is that the standard deviation in a result, the relative standard deviation, that is how much a measurement rel varies relative to its magnitude. You know, it could be 10%, uh, uh, it could be, um, I'm sorry, in this case, Relative standard deviation could be like 3%, 5%, 15%, you know? And then and when you get down into parts per billion and parts per trillion, the relative standard deviation of these measurements is around 25% and it, it stays roughly constant. So there's this sort of exponential increase and then a, and then a, um, plateau in the relative standard deviation of any measurement. Um, it's called the Horowitz trumpet. Called the Horowitz. Maybe he likes trumpets. Okay. So, um, and then the Thompson plateau. I love Harris, but this is so cheap. I have trouble with it. <laughs> So don't worry about any of these formulas, please. It's, it's a bunch of BS. Don't worry. <laughs> Just like it gets worse when it gets more dilute. That's all you got to know. You know. Precision is not as good when things are super dilute. I mean, one milligram per liter here, right? One microgram per liter. A microgram, you can't even see a microgram. It's dissolving an entire liter, you know? And then trillion, that's like, Nanogram per liter. It's like, oh my God, just a few molecules flying around. So don't worry about it. So, uh, range. Da -da -da, you know these linear range, dynamic range. Um, the linear dynamic range is the uh, linear range where there's a, a measurable response. Uh, the robustness, this, this is the Ability to deal with inner laboratory precision. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and basically small deliberate changes, right? I think that's something to remember there, right? So I'm sorry, I'm going through this stuff. Ah, we've, trust me, we're going to slow down. So, um, so let's take a look at this guy. We've got some uh, work to do here. Uh, <clears throat> Plot of one to five meg quinine standards measured by fluorescence, okay. and you can fit it to this line, right? And it has a good R squared. Right? And the question is, is this calibration fit for purpose, right? With a determination of samples of about three megs per liter, right? <clears throat> if 1.5 and 4.5, this is 1.5, 4.5 milliliter quinine spikes of a blank solution yield signals of 194. <clears throat> what the hell? How would you know that, you know? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the thing is that you have a prediction here. You have a measurement here. And you can, you can judge whether or not these predictions are within, the predictions are within um, a few percent of the measurement, and that's how you do that. So basically, uh, it fits the R squared criteria. This is fine. But, uh, you know, 0.999 is, is fine, right? Um, spike recovery, however, here is, um, uh, at 194 uh, parts per million is um, is going to be slightly off of 1.5 mix per liter, right? So um, what this how, the way you do this is this is the equation for the line inverted to solve the tax. Y minus B over M. <clears throat> There's Y, 194. 
there's B and M. And this gives 1.506 things pooling that way. The spike recovery here is 100.4%. Right, that 1.506. For the 4.5 mg per liter spike, the measured concentration is 4.47. So there's the differences, 4.5, 4.47, right? And that gives a spike recovery of 99.3%. Okay. Now, <clears throat> both of these recoveries are within the 100 plus minus 2% criterion that we have. So this, uh, this is deemed fit for purpose, right? So let's let's do one on our own here. <clears throat> if a blank is spiked at three lakes per liter with quinine, we give a signal of 354. What is the predicted quinine concentration and the true value? So let me just get the um, the vital statistics down here. Um, X in PPM is equal to Y minus 36.2 all over 104.8. Let me just make this larger so you can see it with me. You might even want to focus this damn thing. Um, yeah. Um, so now what we have from the color point is that um, 3.00 PPM and a MIG per liter are the same unit uh, for um, uh, if the density is one, roughly. So um, that, that gave a signal of 354.4 units, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, X is that's 354.4. Four minus thirty six point two divided by one point four point eight. <clears throat> three point zero four. That equals three point zero four. Thank you, Alvin. Why is everything weird for me today? Everything's like making me sign in. <laughs> three point zero four, right? So the spike recovery is 3.04 minus 3.00 over 3.00. 0 0.012. Uh, 0. Uh, 0.012. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. It's actually, um, there's no minus there, is there? There's, uh, there's no, uh, it's um, it's 3.04 over 3. Sorry about that. 3.04 divide. It's 1.01. Um, 1.01. Thank you, Alvin. <laughs> Saving my bacon here every time. 1.01. <laughs> so this is 101% um, uh, uh, spike. So this is also um, suitable for purpose, I think. So basically, you know, all, all these are just asking us to do is uh, take the signal and the parts per million that um, of a standard, right? This is this is uh, a standard spike. And uh, then just plug those into the equation. 
uh, get the spike recovery. And basically, we can work that as percent. This gives us 101% spike recovery. So there's that one, right? And uh, <clears throat> so it's pretty simple, right? Um, all right, so moving forward, um, <clears throat> here's an important one to, to understand, right? And it looks a little bit intimidating when you uh, look at it at first, but um, the detection limit and the quantitation limit are um, uh, both ba based on um, these two uh, distributions. <clears throat> uh, so let's first look at a uh, limit of detection. And uh, there's two uh, there's two distributions of results that we're going to consider. Right? A blank distribution and then a sample distribution. Right? <clears throat> and um, Let's focus on the focus on the blank distribution, right? Now there's there's no there's no uh, units on this signal at this point, right? That's because um, any distribution that obeys a, a sort of Gaussian uh, statistics will re result in a distribution something like this, right? Where the signal will fluctuate given the same input, right? And what we'd like to do is define a detection limit such that only about 1% of the determination of this blank signal will give us value as high as a sample at the detection limit. So why did that come up backwards? So um, if you Another way to look at that is that if you put in a sample to this instrument, a sample with a concentration equal to the detection limit, then that sample has a 50% chance of being below the detection limit and a 50% chance of being above the detection limit. Okay? So that's um, that's another way to look at it, right? And, the, and this is three sigma positive of the blank, such that a false positive with a blank has only a 1% chance of occurring. So you could say that at, a, at the detection limit, or, or let, me, let me pose this as a question, right? What is the probability of a false positive or a blank? You know you're a crappy teacher when you ask a basic question and nobody can answer it because you mucked up the explanations. Uh, sorry. Let's see here. So false positive. The false positive probability is X percent. And what is X? 
false positive probability uh, for a blank. is X percent. Let's see here. Uh, I can't remember to turn on the stupid chat because sometimes people say, Roger is goaded. <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. That's so funny. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, definitely true, whatever goaded means. All right. so. Um, you no, know, goat means greatest of all time, right? But I don't think we're talking about that. So, um, so let me pick on somebody who wants to be picked on. Maybe Stephanie or uh, Ryan. People who sometimes interact. The false positive probability for a blank. This is the blank signal, right? And we define that false positive as being at this limit or greater, right? So the probability is on the vertical axis. So the probability of this sample giving it a measurement of this great or, or greater, right, is 1%. <laughs> Does that make sense? Somebody give me feedback. Just... Can you say that just one more time, Professor? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Ah, someone reached out. There's people there. You're actually there. Good. Ah, okay. So <laughs> this is this is signal amplitude. So this is like this is what's fluctuating, right? And if you put in a blank, the average is going to be around here, right? And it's going to be giving these kinds of signals, right? And one percent of them will be above this detection limit, right? 1% of them will give us a, uh, a signal magnitude of 3S or greater. S is the standard deviation. That is the key. Does that make sense, Michaela? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. I mean, I actually, you know, it's, this is a weird one, right? Because it goes from completely opaque to completely obvious. And it's like, boom, this one, like, what the bleep, the boom. And I don't know where anybody is, you know? So the answer is 1%, you know? A false positive probability for a blank is 1%. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> now uh, the detection limit, um, this is a little tedious here, honestly. Um, I don't know if anybody's going to quite do things this way, but um, so uh, basically, to assess detection limit, you take a stand, you you measure a standard. three or more times, right? Right, and then um, you know, you measure a low concentration standard, right? You know, it has to be a, like above one, above the detection limit, right? One to five times, right? And then you, you measure the standard deviation, you know, you, or compute the standard deviation, right? Yeah. Hmm. 
this is so key. It's contagious. And then you measure, um, and you measure the blank, right? Blank value, right? And then <clears throat> the signal detection limit here is uh, y blank plus three s, right? That's um, you can do this with just blank signals, right? <clears throat> the standard deviation of the blank, the, me the measured amplitude of the blank signal gives the detection limit, right? For the signal, the signal, right? <clears throat> now, there's a, there's a thing called the corrected signal, which is the sample signal minus the blank signal, okay? <clears throat> And sometimes we just throw that in there just to make things work, right? So the sample signal minus the blank signal should be M, it's a calibration slope, times the sample concentration, right? So uh, the detection limit in concentration terms is defined as 3S over M. The, the minimum detectable concentration is 3S divided by M, right? So M is the calibration slope, and S is the standard deviation of the blank or something near the blank, right? And this is how you define the minimum standard uh, detectable concentration. So um, let's do an example here. Um, well, here's just another look at it, right? Uh, the detection limit is 3s over m. The quantitation limit is 10s over m. Quantitation is more rigorous than detection, right? You got to go up from 3 to 10 standard deviations in order to say how much is it. You can say it's there when you pass 3s. You can say how much when you pass 10s, right? So, oh my God, this is a tedious one. This is great. I got one for 46, right? So they actually solved this for you, right? I hate how this is sort of like. Seven replicate samples were, were gave these answers, right? And then blanks gave these answers. Okay, uh, samples and blanks. That's all we care about in this, right? And then the, the slope is this, right? Signal detection limit and minimum detectable, detectable concentration. So, um, so signal detection limit here is going to be uh, YDL minus Y by plus 3S, right? <clears throat> this is signal detection limit. will be the blank signal plus three standard deviations will be 2.9. It's really, really simple shit here, right? The average of the blank plus the standard, three times the standard deviation of the blank, right? That's all it is. 1.26, three, da And then the minimum detectable concentration is 3s over n, right? Three times 0.5 over this gives us seven micromoles. Just one or two six things. It's fine because we don't have a huge number of uh, this is based on seven results so you could put two down there what the hell you know 7.3 is fine seven is fine there okay, okay. so um then the concentration of a seven nano one right, one right is sample minus blank over m so this is what x equals y minus b over m y sample b is the blank signal that's the intercept over M, 25 micromoles. So, um, 
So um, let's do this one. Uh, 1.05 and, and 6.3. So minimum detectable concentration if the average of the blanks is 1.05 nanoamps and the standard deviation is 0.63 nanoamps. So, let's see. So, um, what we're trying to do is uh, detect the, the minimum detectable concentration, right? Um, and here we have the, the blank signal is uh, 1.05 nanoamps. <clears throat> and, the, and the standard deviation of that blank signal is 0 0.63 nanoamps. And the slope here from the previous one is 0 0.229 nanoamps per micromolar. So C is equal to V S of B over M is equal to three times 0 0.63 nanoamps divided by 0 0.229 nanoamps per micromolar. And that will be equal to 8.2. Ah, I have it written down, Melvin. They're very fast. But when I'm actually prepared, I get to it just like a split second before, before Alvin gets, gets to me. But thank you. Please continue to check up because I'm going to mess up so badly at many more moments in the future. So thank you. All right. Oh, wait, I should probably leave that there for like a second in case I'm going to it down. So this is just calculating detection limit. Um, so um, <clears throat> recall now that uh, this is all, uh, this is blank signal and that's standard deviation of the blank. So all we're doing is we're putting uh, zero, we're putting our, our, our blank signal here. And then we're, we're trying to develop some statistics around it, such that we can come out to 3S three, three value here. And then the corresponding concentrations are 3S divided by M. And 3S over M at this value there's only 1% chance of a false positive. Okay. All right, so just gonna move forward now. Um, so reporting limits are um, uh, basically subject to, to regulations, right? Um, and the reporting limit is, you know, varies a little bit, but it's usually five to 10 times higher than the detection limit, right? It seems a little bit cheesy to me, but because, you know, if you have something that's dangerous, right? Like here's Here's cis fats, and you know, I'm not like trans fats are going to kill you or anything anytime soon. You know, but if you eat them for every day for years and years, then you're more likely to have heart disease, right? But there's a trans fat, right? And they give it as zero, zero grams, right? But that's really not that they didn't detect any, it's just that they were below like five times less than the uh, five standard deviations of the blank. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not really super happy with this, but it's okay. It's a compromise, you know, like a lot of 
of stuff. All right, moving forward, uh, standard editions. Okay, so standard editions is a way to um, make measurements in a basically a more accurate way to make measurements um, within you know, some sort of uh, analytical method. And the, uh, <clears throat> the standard addition means that you take your sample, whatever that is, and you add standard to the same sample, right? So you could take some blood or something and you could add iron to the blood, right? Add a little bit of concentrated iron solution to a blood sample, right? And then measure. So, um, and you need, always need at least two measurements, right? You need an unspiked and then a spike. You need an original blood and then a blood with some other, with some intentionally added iron in it, right? <clears throat> and the amount by which the spike increases the signal can tell you how much um, iron is in the blood without the spike. So there's a way to calculate that. And the reason that you do it is if the instrument is somehow sensitive to the constituents of the blank, other than the iron, other than the analyte, right? So um, here's a really weird example, which I'm not wild about at all, and I don't really understand at all. But <clears throat> you can use two different introduction methods into a mass spec. Atmospheric pressure chemical ionization and electrospray ionization. Oh my God, you know, what the hell are these? And then why are we plotting one against the other? You know? Well, anyway, or this is with matrix, this is without matrix, right? And when they say matrix here, the matrix is, um, I'm, I'm getting, um, Who's that guy from the Matrix movie? Uh, Lawrence Keanu Fishburne. Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne, right? He's the guy who does the, he's Mo Morpheus. Yeah. Morpheus, yes. Right. So Morpheus is always talking about the Matrix, right? And in our case, the Matrix is just a bunch of chemicals other than the analyte, right? So let's say if you have iron nitrate in pure water, right? The, the matrix is pure water, right? And the analyte is iron nitrate. And uh, um, uh, so, you know, but you could have a more complicated matrix like, like the iron in blood, the matrix is a bunch of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, uh, nucleic acids, you know, um, the water concentration is a little bit lower, da, 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 da. And so all those other things in there can affect the amount of iron that you detect using whatever method you're using, right? They can, they can, they normally will suppress the signal for iron, right? So you say, ah, what do I do here? Well, one thing you can do, it's not really the, it, it's not really the best thing to do for blood, but one thing that you can do to improve it, not necessarily get it exactly right, but to improve it is standard additions. And in standard additions, what you see, do is you take the blood, you measure the iron, and you take a uh, known volume of that blood at a known volume of standard, mix it up, and measure that. And that way you've got an unspiked and a spiked sample, right? And so, oh, uh, when do you do uh, standard additions? When you have matrix effects, right? This is really all you need to remember about this. 
is that you do standard additions when you have matrix effects, right? Matrix effect is a change in the sensitivity. Uh, when you, when you, you know, because of the matrix, you know, in pure water or pure one hour, you know, your solvent is versus um, the actual matrix of the specimen that you're measuring is it blood or seawater or you know I don't know whatever so um, so okay so let's see what else see what's next here is this is a really really confusing uh, description of standard editions two point standard editions right so um, this is uh, strictly two points. And uh, let's see here. And it's confusing because there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of different um, symbols here, right? There's X and S, right? I'm going to actually insert a the box here. I'm going to try say what um, X is the um, it's the analyte and it's from the um, from the from the sample. Right? So X is analyte from the sample. Right? S is analyte from the spike, from the standard that you add, you know, that you spike in, right? So um, I is signal and VI is the um, sample volume. VS is the spike volume. So we've got X and then I. So uh, if you have like X, I, that is the original, um, it's the original concentration of the analyte in the sample, right? So the thing about it is that you dilute, you know, when you, when you spike something, you dilute it, right? So you go from an original concentration to a final concentration, right? Right, so um, one really good way to test yourself with all this nonsense. Change the color here to, to green or something. Um, one, one good way to test yourself with all this is simply to ask yourself, what are we looking for, you know? What do we want to know when we do this analysis? Is it XI? Is it XF? Is it SF? IX? IX plus S? What is this? You know? You know? Actually, IX is a signal from the uh, uh, unspiked sample. And I X plus S is 
the signal from the spike set. So here's the signal from the unspiked sample. There's the signal from the spiked sample. And there's the concentration of X in the unspiked sample. And this is the total concentration of species X because S is X, you know. Right? <laughs> it just comes from a different source, right? It comes from the standard, right? This is, say, iron in blood. This is the same iron in blood. It's diluted, right? So it's a different magnitude. And this is the spike you add in the blood, right? This is a little bit complicated, right? But the signal for iron in blood and the signal for the spiked iron in blood is here, right? So there's a lot of stuff to keep track of, right? Um, so we've got XI, XF, SF, da, 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 right? And basically, once you know all this stuff, you can do this problem, right? Um, uh, I've got like two pages of this stuff to go here. So let's see. Um, yeah, let's do this. This is from page 52. Yeah, we can, we can work through this one. Uh, serum containing sodium gave a 4.41 millivolt signal. Five mils of 2.0 sodium chloride were added, to 95 mils of serum, and spike signal. This spike signal gave 7.82 mils. This is all the information we need. This is I, S, I, S plus X. You know, all this is here. So hold on, let me put us on the document camera so we can see what I'm talking about here. So, um, The sodium sample gave 4.41 millivolts. The, um, that same 95 mils of that plus five mils of this gave 7.92 millivolts. And they're asking for the original sodium ion concentration, right? So all we need to do is define these various parameters. 95 mils, five mils, so we've got VI over VI plus VS is 0.95 over one. VS over VI plus VS is 0.05 over one, right? So when we, um, when we write these down, we've got X sub I over X sub I plus 0.95 plus 2.08 plus 0.05 is equal to this, right? And from there, it's just a question of isolating X sub I and um, basically finding out what X sub I is, right? And they do this in the notes, right? Which I will, I'll repost the notes with the color coding and stuff, right? But basically, it's just algebra from, you know, from here down, it's all just just algebra to find X I. The original concentration of sodium in the sample comes out to 0.126 mole. Oh my God, I'm so goaded, whatever that means. <laughs> okay, guys, I got to go. I didn't get as far as I thought I was going to get today. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good one, Dr. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye. Sorry, I got to go. Bye-bye.